and I had another program which just got over and rushed from there that's why I got delayed so we have two options now of course we always have unlimited options but right now we have two options since you already raised those issues I could address these and or uh, I had a particular structure which I was going to speak on I can speak that and then if we have time we can address these issues how, how much time do you spend on th these points how much how long were you discussing well it's Q&A and talk you can go till 4 okay but how long have you been discussing these oh just for last 15 minutes oh, 15 minutes that's a significant amount of time we just shared some of the points were raised by many so we put that common okay so how would you prefer second second second, second. Okay, so I'll speak what I want and then yes. we can have questions, okay. So, I was just uh, about month and a half ago, I was speaking in Stanford uh, and my topic was make a life, not a living. And one common question that comes up usually that is the spiritual stuff real? So I was not really talking about science and spirituality, I was talking about more of how a spiritual worldview can help us to live life more meaningfully. So, but he was saying, is this real? So I asked, what do you mean by real? Is this scientific? Okay. So then I asked, okay, um, what do you exactly mean by scientific? Can it be proven? Okay. I said, okay. Can you prove that your mother loves you? What do you mean? Obviously my mother loves me. But can you prove it? What do you mean by proof? I said, no, can you mathematically prove that your mother loves you? How do you mathematically prove that? That's not mathematical. I know there are hundreds of occasions in my life and my mother extended myself so much for me that I know that my mother loves me. So, with respect to many of the activities in our life we we have we have appropriate ways of knowing things so yes science is a very powerful tool for acquiring knowledge and with science we can understand a lot of things at the same time it is one tool for acquiring knowledge and if now if i ask you what is the temperature in what is the time in la right now now you could just uh, google it up and find out and say it's 11.38. So okay now that's this and if, if you say this I can confirm it by going on google I can co call somebody and find out. So basically there are the, the way I can confirm what is the temperature now or what is the time now that is very different from the way we can infer does someone love us. There are different ways of knowing things. Now, with all our scientific advancement, we cannot have anything called a loveometer. Now, nowadays, one of the greatest fears of people is forming relationships. When we try to form a relationship, there is a fear of rejection. So, the person abandons me, betrays me. So, now if two people want to form a relationship at that time, if uh, they want to know, does this person really care for me? Or do they care for my money? They care for my looks? They care for what do they care for? Now, if you want to, you could just have a meter, put it on their chest. Do you really love me? Yes. Oh, good. Get lost. No, get lost. Now, we can't have a love meter. Now, love is real, but it's not measurable in the same way that, say, temperature or blood pressure is measurable. So, the point is there are different ways of knowing things. And atheism often tries to reject theism by applying an inappropriate method for knowing it. Like I insist, you prove that your mother loves, to, loves you and prove it mathematically. Now, how am I going to prove it mathematically? So if the method of knowing is not appropriate to the object of knowing, then whatever knowledge we get, it will be flawed. If somebody says that, if you can't mathematically prove that your mother loves me, therefore your mother doesn't love you. Now that would be an invalid inference. So, the, so now, uh, I just, with this background, I will talk about how faith as such is required in every walk of life. 
and how we function with faith. But we have, when we are going through life, we have to choose between different worldviews. Broadly speaking, either theistic worldview or atheistic worldview. And atheists are often aggressive, saying that you are religious people. You believe in some imaginary being who exists somewhere. You are so irrational. So often atheism claims to be intellectually superior and more rational than theism. But we'll see if we go deeper into the matter, the reality is quite different. So I'll, the title was, what is the title today? Does anyone remember? Why? Yes, our atheism requires more faith than theism. So I'll use the acronym MORE and I'll talk about four points. So M O R E. Okay. So M is meaning. Meaning, what does it mean in this context? Steven Weinberg is a Nobel laureate physicist and he said famously that the more the universe becomes comprehensible, the more it seems meaningless. The more the universe becomes comprehensible, the more it seems meaningless. Now what does he mean by, what, what, in what sense of meaning is he talking about and what type of comprehensibility is he talking about? First let's understand the paradox in this. Say so suppose somebody hands you a message, this is very important and then you look at it and you find that it is actually in some strange script. What is this? It just looks like some markings on paper but then you ask someone, you know it is in that particular script. It's a Sumerian script from ancient Sumeria. Oh really? And then you start finding out what is the script? What does the marking mean? What does this letter mean? What does this word mean? And gradually as you come to know about that script, then what happens? The more the message becomes comprehensible. Okay, this symbol means this word, this particular letter. This means this word, this means this word, this means this word. And the more the message becomes comprehensible, what should happen? The more it should become meaningful, isn't it? Oh, I understood this word, I understood this word, I understood this. So the more something becomes comprehensible, the more it should become meaningful. But suppose you struggled through and understood the script, the letters, the words, and after that, you found the whole thing doesn't make sense. Hey, what's going on? <coughs> you could say that somebody just uh, in, crazily scribbled something on paper. There was never any meaning in it. That could be one way of looking at it. But another way would be that maybe I'm missing something. Because the scribblings are not just random. The scribblings do, at least each scribbling means something. Each letter means something, each word means something. So if the whole thing is not making any sense, then maybe I am missing something. Is it? If the whole thing were meaningless, then why should the scribblings match any script at all? So the same principle applies to the study of the universe. So if we see uh, the age of science more or less began with what is called as the scientific revolution and uh, Newton was probably among the pioneers of course before uh, the others were also there but Newton is most famously celebrated does anyone know which is the most famous incident which says is said to have started the scientific revolution apple falling. yes apple falling so some people say the apple fell in front of him some people say it fell on him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whichever way so I had gone when I, I gone to Cambridge to speak on science and spirituality we pass by that same tree. So that tree is preserved. It's like a pilgrimage place for scientists. <laughs> they go and try to get inspiration. Oh, Einstein was, Newton was so brilliant. Now certainly Newton's brilliance is to be appreciated. Through an ordinary incident, like a fruit falling, he inferred about the nature of uh, gravity. At the same time, Let's look at, let's look a step back and say he asked the question, what made this fruit fall? So this question itself raises a question that 
this question has an assumption to it that means fruits don't just fall by chance newton assumed that there is some underlying order in nature and then he was trying to understand the specific mechanism of that order so if there was if he were thinking that nature was completely arbitrary random then he wouldn't even ask that question uh, paul davies is a skeptical scientist one of the prominent scientists in the world he said that even the most rigorous atheist begins the study of the universe with the unexplained faith that the universe has some order in it science would not be able to function if we did not believe that there is some order what all of scientific advancement is what we make repeated observations then we try to make some patterns out of those observations and on the basis of the patterns we make a theory and we do experiments to verify the theory but the idea when we are doing the experiments is that these observation either when we are doing the experiments or when we are doing the observations is that there is some order in nature and that's the order we want to discern so the point i'm making is if we consider nature to be like a message in some foreign script we find that okay okay why do objects fall like this that's because of gravity now why does the temperature rise it's because of thermodynamics okay why is current flowing through this but not through that oh that is because of the principle of electricity some things are conductor some things are semiconductor some are insulators so like that science basically helps us to make sense of how nature functions and in the last few several hundred years we have been able to acquire so much knowledge which was not there a few hundred years ago however as we are understanding more and more about nature in terms of specifics okay this is how this works this is how this works this is how this works but in terms of an integrated picture we are not understanding anything so okay why do fruits fall down that's because of gravity why does the temperature rise or oh, because of thermodynamics whatever but why do we exist what is the meaning of life why does the universe exist it's meaningless there is no point to it this doesn't make sense if we consider nature to be like a message then each scribbling makes sense the words make sense but the whole thing doesn't come together so might we be missing something now you could say conceivably that everything is just a random scribbling without any purpose behind it. it's possible but then the question comes up then why would any particular scribbling so precisely match some script so another uh, nobel laureate eugene wigner he said he has written a paper called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences and so that means his point is that maths is basically a tool which we human beings have constructed for uh, for analyzing nature now what what do i mean by tool you have constructed at a very at a very little level you can say the imagine a number square root of minus 1 it doesn't exist in nature so many mathematical concepts they don't literally exist in nature but why is it that concepts created by our mind correlate with how nature functions out there this correlation is very remarkable now i am taking this as further a little further what i earlier gave the example of the script that the script means that this this there are some scribblings out there and those scribblings correlate with the particular script so our mind has the ability to come up with mathematics and nature has the ability to or nature features uh patterns which are also in the language which are also understandable in the language of mathematics that means somebody has written the scribblings in a language that we can understand and yet the scribblings of the complete picture don't make sense so why should it be like this might we be missing something and this is how actually science functions science never 
within its particular search for knowledge never abandons the idea of order say for example newtonian physics for a long time it acted as a, a bedrock of science but till the 20th century the 20th the start of the 20th century a scientist started studying the very small and the very big the microscopic and the macroscopic they found that newtonian physics didn't work subatomic particles the way they moved couldn't understand based on based on newtonian physics and similarly very big objects moving very fast nearing the speed of light they also their behavior couldn't be understood with newtonian physics now when newtonian physics which was a bedrock of science for that that much time when it stopped working scientists did not say that oh there is no order in nature they said maybe we are missing something maybe there is some bigger order of which we are understanding some part and that's how scientists developed two different theories does anyone know which one relativity is for the macroscopic for the big objects and for the microscopic quantum physics. quantum physics yes thank you so basically what happened is that science operates on the faith that the nature features meaning and here was one important point i'm making in this uh, i'm i'm not saying is a science against theism rather science is a tool for acquiring knowledge theism is here atheism is here atheism often acts as a parasite on science that means atheism claims credibility based on science but as i said for science to function there is a presumption that there is order in nature and atheism has no explanation for that presumption so we are not pitting theism against science we are seeing science as a as a tool for acquiring knowledge and it is phenomenally powerful and the validity of science itself which does the theism make science more valid or does atheism make science more valid make more valid means the working of science which world view makes more sense so with atheism there is no reason why science should work yeah i hope this point is clear at if newton had been atheist he would not even have asked the question what made the fruit fall it just things just happen so science started and science is sustained by the faith that nature has order and nature features some order where does the order within nature come from that is best explained by a theistic world view rather than a atheistic world view okay so as i said i'm going to talk about these four points and this is a little heavy discussion so i would prefer that we break it apart and if you have any questions right now after more each of these we can have some questions and then we can move forward so any comments or questions till now Yes, please. Prabhu, like as we are talking about faith and atheism in in the context, so do you think that uh, it could also be that a, at one point, like science can agree with the religious views and perspective, and we can actually function together, right? Because right now we have seen that you know the the thesis and the atheist they are like separating a more a bit more. in like 90s they were at least much more closer and working together right so do you think it's possible because uh in meantime whether you follow religion or you follow scientific principles uh the point for us is to understand the meaning of life and how to lead it in a better way because okay i have seen uh, a couple uh, they were like okay uh we are atheists but we still have faith in each other and they were like the faith was such so strong they are like uh the woman can ask his husband any time i can i unload on you because you know it's human nature you get angry at sometimes and if husband says no she will stop it off if husband agrees then she will just unload and then husband will ignore that part right so i think faith is still there because we are talking about the meaning of faith itself and so faith can not be just in god it can also be between people and faith in machines as well right if i have faith in toronto transit system i can come over here right so 
in that context? Okay, good question. So there are many points in this question, but it's um, I'll address some of them. See, first is that ultimately we want to live a we want to live a meaningful, good life. So can a, can atheists come together in the pursuit of a good life? And sometimes atheists might also be very understanding with each other, and they might care for each other, and they might be able to live well. They might, yes. So there's a question that can atheists be good people? And there's a different question: can atheism make people good? There are two different questions. So athe can atheists be good people? Definitely. There can be because ultimately our world view or specifically our you could use the uh, uh, yeah our belief system our world view that is only one part of who we are mm -hmm. so the bhagavad gita explains that there are three modes of material nature sattva rajas tamas goodness passion and ignorance and broadly speaking wh what does it mean that some people make things happen some people watch things happen and some people wonder what happened <laughs> 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 so that is goodness, passion, and ignorance. These are thoughtful people. They think, they plan. No, not these people in goodness. They are thoughtful people. They think and make things happen. Uh, those are in passion. They just run around doing this, doing this, doing that. And they don't think, think or plan. They do one thing, but another thing goes wrong. Another this happened, and they just make a mess of things. And people are ignorant, are just lost in their own heads. Maybe drunk or and, and, uh, and basically they are just not even aware what is happening around them. So now this division of human psychology, the Bhagavad Gita gives it independent of one's spiritual orientation. So you could have a theist who is in ignorance. That means somebody is a, some, some claims to believe in God, but they are violent, they are intolerant, they are irrational. And you can have a the atheist who may be in goodness. And they might be very calm, very reasonable, uh, very sensitive, very nature loving. So this, <coughs> we could talk about two, two terms over here. There are operational values and there are foundational values. So operational values means how we live in the world. Foundational values means what is it that we ultimately believe about the world? What, what is the foundation of our life? So one example to understand this could be that, say that if somebody is driving a car. So operational value means how well do they drive the car. Foundational value means where are they going by driving. So if somebody is lost about where they are going, I mean they are driving very smoothly, following all the rules, taking excellent care of the car. Not, not troubling other drivers by haywire, by haywire driving. They're driving very well. So, in terms of the perspective on the road, we say this person is a very good driver. And that person is a terrible driver. So somebody might be a very poor driver, but they might be driving to the right destination. Now, of course, whether they will get there or not, that's a different question. They're driving poorly, they might cause a wreck. So, like, so all of us, we have functional or op functional or operational values and we have foundational or fundamental values. So, in terms of functional values, all of us fall somewhere in the spectrum of the three modes, goodness, passion, ignorance. So, to the extent people come to goodness, there can be reasonable discussion and there can be also uh, respectful disagreement. As I said, we can agree to disagree. I was at an interfaith conference in Washington DC recently and there was a Muslim over there. So he was telling me that, that you know, I can communicate better with moderates from other traditions than with extremists from my own tradition. So extremists means those who are in passion or ignorance. So they are intolerant. They just even moderate, although you might have one particular category, these are all, these are Hindus or these are Muslims or these are Christians or even these are atheists. But that is sometimes theism or religion is such a big category that it can be very unhelpful. 
within religion you can have the amish people who you know, there, there was a movie ever called amish grace where uh, there, there was a serial killer who rushed into an amish school and killed any of the children and the amish chose to forgive him and he killed himself they went not only they forgave they forgave him but they went off and offered their support and assistance to his widow and his children so now they are also religious and we can have we can have jihadis who not only kill innocent children but they use children to kill children many of these terrorists was indoctrinated they were 16 17 15 and they use them to kill others so the religion is such a big category you know what do you mean by religion i may say by religion i am talking about the amish and somebody else might be talking about the jihadis so you're not talking about the same thing at all that's why we have to look at what are the functional values from the functional perspective in the world when we are living the functional values are very important and in that sense a uh, atheist might live more harmoniously if the atheist is in goodness and the theist might live less harmoniously more disharmoniously if the theist is in passion or ignorance so to the extent our consciousness arises rises upwards we become more thoughtful more reflective the, to the extent we come to goodness we all can live uh, with our differences more harmoniously and so so can atheists be good people definitely but can atheism make people good i'll talk about this more in the last e m o r e e is going to have there but atheism itself does not contain any imperative for inner transformation so if theism is understood properly if i understand that i am accountable to god and each of my actions i'll be responsible for them then there is a impetus for inner transformation so atheists can be good people and theists can be bad people that's possible but if we can if instead of comparing good atheists with ba uh, bad theists we compare bad atheists with bad atheists and we compare good good theists with good atheists then the impetus for transformation is more in uh, if we have a theistic world view the impetus and the capability the resources also i'll come to that later but yes irrespective of our world views if we come more to goodness then we can all live more harmoniously okay thank you so i have one more question yeah so we're talking about meaning right about what the meaning like for example new yeah. so why that kind of explanation is not there in uh, scriptures in or is it there we don't know about it okay so okay so we could have always referred to that right? okay So say we talked about Newton and theory of gravity. Why, why the, that kind of explanation not there in scripture? See, each book has its particular purpose, mm -hmm. and if we look at the book itself, it is telling its purpose. Say, for example, Arjun, when he is asked at the start of the Bhagavad Gita, is asking a particular question. Say, if you come for a class, and it's a question answer session, and you came after the question was asked. and you are hearing the answer and you may understand each point but what is discussed what is the whole point being discussed you will not be able to understand it isn't it so to understand the bhagavad gita we have to understand what is the question to which the gita is the answer and that question is pruchami tvam dharma sammoda chetaha i am asking you what is dharma dharma means how what is the right way to live what is the right course of action so the the bhagavad gita is not a book talking about the physical nature of the universe the bhagavad gita is a book talking about the right course of action shrimad the shrimad bhagavatam if we consider it is spoken to a king who is about to die parikshit maharaj and the thrust of the bhagavatam is what how to prepare your consciousness when you are going to die how to remember the eternal when we are ending our stay in the temporal So now the whole Bhagavatam is centered on that purpose. And no book can have all knowledge about everything. And <clears throat> if somebody is reading, say, a book about English grammar, and then you ask, you know, why is there no knowledge of physics in this? 
So it's a book about English grammar. If you want to study physics, go to some other branch. So Galileo famously said that, you know, that science tells us how the heavens go. Religion tells us how to go to the heavens. How the heavens go means how do the planets move. That's what science tells us. But how to go to the heavens means how to raise your consciousness and go to a higher level of existence. So, so these are two distinct bodies of knowledge. And now some people may say that oh scripture also contains the scientific knowledge. Yeah, it may contain. But if we position scripture and science as competitors, by doing that we devalue scripture. Scripture is not here to give a scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge is a very powerful way of acquiring knowledge, a powerful tool for acquiring knowledge. But science gives us knowledge about a particular portion of reality. What is the portion of reality? That is science tells us, science operates based on a phenomenon we call as methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism means science provides us material explanations for material phenomena or natural explanations for natural phenomena. That means that Newton saw the fruit falling and now he could have said what made the fruit fall? God made the fruit fall. Now he accepted the existence of God. He also, ex he also famously said that you know, uh, the orderly nature of the solar system, this could not have come without a great intelligent being behind that. But when he is looking for an explanation, he is not looking, at, he, when he is studying, studying it as a scientist, he is not looking for God as an explanation. He is not rejecting God as an explanation, but he is looking for the material mechanism. So a material mechanism and an intelligent agent, these two are not contradictory they are complementary. It's like, suppose, uh, so did all of you have lunch or are you going to have some food after this? Okay, okay. So suppose you had, suppose there's going to be prasad after this. Of course, there's no suppose, prasad is there now. <laughs> but now, <laughs> if something is cooked very nicely, now you may, oh, somebody may want to know, okay, who cooked this? And that is a valid question. And somebody may want to know, what is the recipe for this? What are the ingredients? What is the process? Now, knowing the recipe and knowing the cook, they are two complementary knowledges, isn't it? They are not contradictory. Just because I have a recipe doesn't mean I don't need a cook. And just because I have a cook doesn't mean I don't need a recipe. Both are valid. So if I want to develop a personal relationship with the, with the person who made that, then I will ask about that and ask about the cook. But if I also want to cook, I, say I just need the recipe then. So science basically asks for the recipe. Science doesn't ask about the cook. So at least Newton did not deny the existence of cook. He accepted there's a cook, but I want to know the recipe. But what happened? Subsequent generations of scientists, science, science, or more you could say, in the subsequent generations, atheists started taking over science. And then they started saying, if you just have the ingredients, why do you need a cook? <laughs> so that's how science started becoming atheistic. Or rather, atheists started taking over science. Now, even now, in America, a survey that uh, done, that about 50% of scientists are theists, 50% are atheists. Now, you can define theism in a loose way. Specific, you can say personal God or just some over, over, uh, overseeing, some, some kind of organizing intelligence. That's different. So the point is that scripture, we, we don't go to scripture to seek scientific knowledge. We go to scripture to learn about how to raise our consciousness. So these are two different branches of knowledge. And if you understand their domains, then the conflict can be significantly avoided. Now, there might be some areas of uh, conflict and there has to be some intelligent resolution of that. But overall, there are two different domains of knowledge. Uh, one way I put it is that science can make things better. Spirituality can make people better. 
Science can transform the outer world, and spirituality can transform our inner world. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions till now? Okay. So let's move on. What is the acronym we are discussing? More. More. M was meaning. Meaning. Okay. Thank you. Now O is origin. Origin means that why does anything uh, exist at all? Now atheists often argue this question that okay, if God made everything, then who made God? And I'll come to the answer to that question quickly. But let's look at the alternative that atheism offers us. Earlier I said meaning is say it's like a message. It's like a message written in a particular script. And the script is making sense, but the whole message is not making sense. So one way to make sense would be, let's go behind and look at who sent the message. So where did the universe, where did everything come from? So what is the atheistic explanation for this? We can have many big, big terms, but if you can remove all the names of big theories or whatever, the essential explanation of atheism for the origin of the universe is this. Nothing existed because of nothing. Nothing exploded because of nothing. And nothing gave rise to everything. Three sentences. That's all. Nothing existed because of nothing. Nothing exploded because of nothing. And nothing gave rise to everything. It's spectacularly reasonable, isn't it? It just doesn't make any sense. There's a physicist, there's a scientist Cross, not C R O S E, K R A U S S. So he wrote a book called How Everything Came From Nothing. And now that book was hyped up by atheists. But even there are, uh, there are scientists who are not theists, they reviewed that book. And basically his whole book, what is he doing? He's not explaining how everything came from nothing. He's basically redefining nothing so that it is something. What is he doing? He's saying that nothing is a complex quantum mechanical vacuum that requires pages and pages of the most abstract mathematics to describe. And from that nothing, something came about. <laughs> but that only begs the question, where did that nothing come from? So that is not nothing as is ordinarily understood. So what suggests by putting nothing in double codes? We don't explain anything, isn't it? That's what they're doing, rede redefining nothing. So basically, within the atheistic worldview, uh, why does anything exist at all? That, that is not explainable. And we could further say that, that nothing is, nothing has to have the potentiality to manifest everything. So where did it come from? Stephen Hawking was a brilliant scientist and he was a very poor philosopher. In his area, he was brilliant. But what happens sometimes, uh, scientists, because of overconfidence, they out step out of their territory. So, <clears throat> he, he, he wrote a book called The Grand Design. And you know, what is the thesis of that book basically? The design is so grand that it does not require a designer. That's the thesis of the book. But that book is filled with so many terrible paradoxes. And... There are scientists themselves who have had strong issues with the book. So the one of the beginning sentences of this book is, one of the defining sentences of this book is, because of, the because of the laws of nature, the universe created itself out of nothing. Now, let's actually, I have a whole class on this one sentence. I will not go into, I will just talk about few problems with this. Because the, law, because the laws of nature, the universe created itself out of nothing. Now here, what is he saying? The universe created itself. Out of what? Out of nothing. But then, because of the laws of nature. That means the laws of nature are already existing. So it's not nothing. Isn't it? If the laws of nature are already existing, then it's not nothing. That's, that's a big problem. And even if we assume the laws of nature are existing, 
द लॉज ऑफ नेचर डू नॉट डू एनीथिंग ओके क्विक क्वेश्चन हाउ मच इज फाइव हंड्रेड प्लस सेवन हंड्रेड ट्वेल्व हंड्रेड डू यू हैव ट्वेल्व हंड्रेड डॉलर इन योर पॉकेट फाइव हंड्रेड प्लस सेवन हंड्रेड इज ट्वेल्व हंड्रेड सो यू हैव ट्वेल्व हंड्रेड डॉलर इन योर पॉकेट See what nonsense, isn't it? See the laws of nature, the laws of mathematics don't do anything. The laws of mathematics only describe the connection between causes and effects. So if you had five hundred dollars in one pocket and then somebody gave you seven hundred dollars, then the laws of mathematics will tell you that now you will have twelve hundred dollars. But the laws of mathematics themselves don't do anything. Now somebody can be the can be a mathematician who can multiply 13 digit numbers with a twinkling of an eye but that multiplying is not going to multiply their bank account isn't it the laws of nature don't do anything say now the world cricket world cup is going to come up soon say we have the world cup finals and india pakistan matches there last ball <laughs> and the we have who is india's top batsman kohli so kohli is batting and last ball we need a six and the bowler bowls and he hits the ball all goes over the boundary it's a sixer and everybody celebrates and there's a post match interview so they ask him how did you hit a six this is by newton's laws of motion <laughs> now that's not an explanation is it now by newton's laws of motion you could say oh he hit the ball with this force the ball and the bat collided in this angle and that's why the ball went over the boundary newton's laws of motion don't explain why the bat existed why the ball existed why the match existed why the ground existed why the boundary existed newton's laws of motion only explain that if all these are existing and if all these come in coordinated contact then what will be the result so i hope this point is clear what the laws of motion laws of motion first of all there has to be certain things which need to exist on and they need to interact both things there has to be existence and there has to be interaction and then the pattern of the interaction can be correlated by the laws of physics so as far as origin is concerned atheism can't explain anything at all so because of the laws of nature the universe created itself out of nothing well first of all where you nothing is not the laws of nature and secondly even laws of nature the laws of nature don't lead to anything at all so the atheistic explanation of nothing simply involves redefining nothing and it also explains nothing but now what about theism we can say so is okay you say oh what is the explanation for you say everything came from god god is the origin but then where did god come from it's a valid question uh, but the question is like asking when you ask who created god is like asking who made a circle circular now what do you mean who made a circle circular <laughs> who made a circle circular what is the answer mathematics. yeah mathematics a little more precise that's that's the nature of the yeah that is the nature it's a definition you know it's a, it's a definition so when we ask who made god actually we are not we are not if somebody asks who made the circle circular you know you don't know the definition of circle a circle means it will be circular so the definition of god is that god is the cause of all causes sarva karana karana if you are asking who made god that means we are not understood the idea of god only that's why when we are talking about god we need to begin with definition not with depiction depiction means we might say oh in a temple or in a church or somewhere god is depicted to be like this how can this being be god that's that's a valid question but don't begin with the depiction begin with the definition god by definition is the source of everything the cause of all causes and if the cause of all causes had a cause then the cause of the cause of all causes is the cause of all causes so wherever this chain stops wherever the causal chain stops that is god so now does it have to stop somewhere 
can you have just an endless causal chain going on? Now, in atheists also, from the pure point of view logic, they said it's not possible. Because it's like, say, if you have a 100-story building, you start from the 100 level, 100 level, this level 100, it is finite, maybe 15 feet, 20 feet. Then you come to the 99th, 98th, 97th. So each of them is finite. From the, this, is, this is again, no, I'm, this, is a, this is a class with the PowerPoint and everything, but I'm giving a simple argument over, simply, simplified explanation of this argument, that if you have a series of finite objects, the, at the basis of that finite objects, you have to have something which is different category. Like if we have 100 levels, below that you have to have the ground. So even from scientific perspective, science is very clear that the universe has a beginning. In the Big Bang Theory, spe the specifics apart, the Big Bang Theory, what it, what it proved or what it, or what it was based on, rather not proved, that the universe has a beginning. Now scientists are almost near unanimous about, about that one thing. The universe is not eternal. So if the universe has a beginning, then what was, what was there before the beginning? Or how did that beginning take place? That question comes up. So atheism does not have any explanation for how everything came from nothing. Now does theism have an explanation? You could say that, that also doesn't make sense. But comparatively speaking, what we could say is that if there is a being with intelligence and with energy, then from that being, things could manifest. If somebody asks, how did this building come about? Well, there was nothing in the building came. No, that doesn't make sense. If there was a, if there was a wealthy builder with building ingredients, then the building could come about. So what we say is that God God is the supreme being who exists outside time and space and one of his energies is matter and with that material energy he creates everything. So now what do I mean by he exists outside time and space? It's like suppose um, somebody reads a Harry Potter novel. Hmm? Uh, all of you too old for Harry Potter? Um, what, what is the current fiction popular? Anything? Game of Thrones. Sorry? Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, okay. So, okay, so somebody reads a, it's a book or it's a, I thought it's a, it was a book. It's, it's a, I know it's a TV show or a, it's a movie or a TV show now? TV. Yeah, TV show, I know about it, yes. Suppose somebody is reading, a, or there are the, what are the Hunger Games or something like that? Whatever. So now, if somebody. I just increase the Okay. Have you been able to hear me till now? Or it's been difficult? <laughs> okay. Sure. So suppose we are the Game of Thrones. Now suppose somebody reads the whole book and okay, this character, this character, this character. And then you come to know the book has an author. Who is the author of? Does it have an author? <laughs> Sorry? George R. R. Martin. George Martin. George R. R. Martin. George R. R. Martin. Okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so suppose so a child first time looks at the Game of Thrones and he's intrigued by it. And at the end he comes to know, oh, this is the author. And he starts reading the whole book. Oh, where is the author in the book? This page, this page, this page. I read the whole book. There's no author in the book. Therefore, the author doesn't exist. Your brain doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> See, the author, it's, if it's a fictional narrative, then the author does not exist in the narrative. The author created the timeline, the author created the storyline, the author created the characters, but the author exists outside of it. So similarly, God creates the, the framework of space and time. And God creates the mechanisms by which this framework interacts. But God exists outside this framework. So you might say, in the, in the novel you can say, oh, this character was born from this character. This character came from this character. This character came from this character. But if you want to ask, where did the author come from? Well, the author exists in a different category. So similarly, God, to ask, God, where did God come from? 
God exists outside the cause-effect chain that characterizes the material world. And that's why this question indicates that we have not understood the idea of God. So it's, that's why I said uh, asking the question about origin is like asking what made a circle circular or who made a circle circular. Circle by definition is circular and God by definition exists outside the chain of cause and effect. So this now you can, we can say that I don't believe in God. Why should I believe in God? Okay, fine. You don't believe in God, then what are you left with? You have to believe that extremely complex quantum mechanical vacuum existed and from that everything came about. Well, that, from a purely rational perspective, that requires far more faith. Now, how did this quantum mechanical vacuum come about? How did the quantum mechanical vacuum have the potential to create everything? What activated the quantum mechanical vacuum? We don't know that. So, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a much, much more simpler and rational hypothesis to suggest that there is one conscious intelligent being as the source of everything rather than an unconscious vastness of quantum mechanical vacuum whose origin remains unexplainable. So that is with respect to what is the acronym? O. Oh, O is origins. So any questions about this? Okay. Okay. Sorry, I, I have a tiny confusion. Uh, in one of the lectures I heard that uh, it was by going through, he was mentioning that uh, the example that you gave that the author does not exist in the book, but Krishna exists in, in the Mahabharata. Then he was saying, then he was, uh, I don't remember exactly, but he was also referring to Valmiki in that okay. class. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. So, Krishna exists in the Mahabharata, or Valmiki exists in the Ramayana, doesn't the author exist in the book? Yeah, see, there are different kinds of books. Now, if it's an autobiography, obviously the author has to be there in the book. The author has to be there throughout the book. Hmm? But um, if it's a history, then if the author was a character in the period of history being depicted, the author will be there in the book. But if it is either a history in which the author was not, the author did not exist. Say if somebody, if somebody is writing a history of the 18th century and they are writing in the 21st century now, then obviously they can't be there in the book. If somebody is writing a fiction, then they can't be there in that book. So it depends on what kind of book we are writing. And now, specifically the point of the example of a book which I gave over here uh, is different, the context is different from that context over there. The context there is that uh, Valmiki, how did he know about the Ramayana? Because Valmiki was contemporaneous. So Valmiki was there and Valmiki interacted with Ram also. So in a sense, uh, that storyline has Valmiki as a character over there. And when we say that God exists outside time and space, and then think of Krishna coming in the Mahabharata or Krishna coming in the Bhagavad Gita. See, one of the principles of the Bhakti tradition is that God, although God exists outside time and fray, time and space, that does not mean that He is forced to always exist outside time and space. From outside the fabric of time and space, He can also enter into this fabric. And that is the whole concept of avatar. Avatar means avatarati, avatarati iti avatar, one who descends from a higher level to this level. So although God is infinite, He comes within this finite realm. He comes with a finite form. So that is also, if we say that God is omnipotent and you say, oh, God is infinite, so He cannot come in this world. Well, then how is He omnipotent? If He is omnipotent, He can manifest in this world also. So Krishna. Uh, was on the lap of Mother Yashoda, but when she asked him to open his mouth, he showed the whole universe. So although he is within the universe, still the universe is within him. That is his extraordinary ability. So God can manifest within the fabric of time and space. But that doesn't mean that he belongs within that time and space, within that fabric. He manifests over there and he becomes unmanifest from there. And he has his self-existence beyond this world eternally okay thank you good question so let's move on now r is we are discussing more m was 
meaning o is origin. origin so r is reason or rationality this is a little difficult to explain and maybe if you don't understand you can help me to understand what you don't understand then i'll try to explain it so now atheists often say that religion is irrational and theism uh, and atheism is more rational okay we'll put that aside but right now let's look at which world view gives a reason for reason <coughs> what does it mean by reason for reason if we look at we consider purely atheistic world view now every point that i am making this is i am not going to reference it, but there are very respected scientists and philosophers who have talked about all these points so if we consider a purely atheistic world view where we consider uh, evolution as a completely unguided process then evolution has has shaped us primarily for the purpose of survival evolution basically has two purposes survival and reproduction that is the purpose for which all living beings are shaped now with this understanding if we are geared for survival alone then we are not biologically wired to no metaphysics our, our biological wiring is not to know the nature of ultimate reality our biological wiring is simply to know the nature of the immediate reality okay what can i eat and how can i mate how can i protect myself from attacker so even atheists say this that you know evolution they don't talk exactly about ahar nidra bhay maithun eating sleeping mating defending but that's what they talk about is yes, for eating taking care of the bodily needs for reproducing and protecting oneself this is what evolution has wired us for so evolution has not wired us for understanding answers to ultimate questions okay uh, if we are just you could say biological machines who are not wired for anything like this we just wired for survival then three questions come up one is why do we want to know about the ultimate purpose at all Now, throughout history there have been thinkers who have thought what is the meaning of life even now today we live in an age of extraordinary distraction like today's age has been described by one social critic as people are distracted from distraction by distraction <laughs> <laughs> we are watching maybe we are watching one movie which is a distraction and from that we are distracted okay let's watch another movie or let's watch this so even in today's age where there are so many distractions still there are people who are asking questions what is the meaning of life what is the point of all this not many but still people are asking so if we were simply wired by evolution for survival first of all why do we get this question only oh to whatever extent scientists have studied animals and no dog asks why do i exist they don't ask the purpose so why do we humans ask i might say okay you know our brain is more and more developed our brain is bigger okay fine but asking questions about the ultimate purpose of life what what evolutionary advantage does it provide it doesn't provide any advantage in terms of surviving or reproducing at all so why do we have this capacity at all to ask big questions about life that's the first point second is that why should reason work why should reason work means why should our brains have the capacity for rational thinking and how do we know that what we think by our rationality that it is for real that it is actually like that you yeah, suppose now we come to know that in the in the prasad after this program there are pakodas and say you like pakodas 
so now pakodas they pakad your imagination <laughs> so <laughs> pakodas catch your imagination and start thinking about it then what happens your tongue starts salivating now when the tongue starts salivating uh, is that saliva rational or irrational is that saliva true or false okay i mean sal saliva is really there but that that saliva necessarily itself talk about reality or unreality the saliva is your saliva there's a stimulus and a saliva now you may now you can say the saliva is true but suppose you go after that for prasad and you find that actually the idea that the pakoda was just a rumor there are no pakodas <laughs> then what happens <laughs> then what has happened the stimulus is not there so the point i am making here is that if our tongue salivates that saliva itself is just a bodily secretion it does not tell us anything about the nature of reality the secretion of saliva doesn't tell us whether there is a particular food item out there or not it may be there it may not be there i remember once uh, i was somewhere and uh, i was in pune or somewhere out there and then you know the devotees had uh, after uh, there was a program after there was prasad and i saw there like like 25 big cake pieces i thought this is amazing you know how do they make so many cakes and i said give me one and i took that cake and then i ate it i realized it was bread <laughs> i it was a thought of cake it looked like a cake but it was just bread so what happened is our perceptions can go wrong now these are not just perceptions there can be secretions also within us but just because a particular thing is secreted doesn't necessarily mean that it reflects anything about the nature of outer reality now within the purely atheistic world view even everything that happens in the brain is also just electrochemical secretions in the brain and just as a secretion in the tongue does not necessarily tell us anything about the nature of reality similarly a secretion in the brain doesn't tell us anything about the nature of reality so basically an atheistic world view is also a brain secretion and a theistic world view also is a brain secretion so what happened what happens if we rigidly take a atheistic world view to its conclusion is that there is no reason for reason that means there is no reason why reason should be able to give us why reason by by reason I mean rationality reason should be able to help us understand reality because you know in in you a particular brains particular particular ideas secrete the brains and that's why you feel this is real in me something else secretes it. the uh, secretes uh, causes brain secretion and i think this is real now how do we assert so if there is no innate capacity within us for perceiving the truth if we are simply simply biological robots biological machines then not only does it disprove he is not only it doesn't disprove but it doesn't disprove anything rather it disproves our capacity to know anything we cannot know anything at all neither theism nor atheism but you know we all seek to acquire some knowledge so if we that means here what i'm trying to say is that if we consider evolution as a absolute truth evolution undercuts the authority of all knowledge even our knowledge of science and even our knowledge of evolution itself so if you take a evolutionary world view to its extreme it destroys our capacity for knowing anything at all because evolution reduces all knowledge to simply brain secretions and if the brain secretions come because of some false perception that's how the brain secretions are within me and so i think this is right that you think your brain secretions are happening that way that you think that is right 
there is no ultimate foundation for basis for knowing anything at all i'll give to example quickly to illustrate what i'm saying so if i tell you right now i can't speak a single word of english <laughs> what would be your reaction joke sorry <laughs> why is it a joke <laughs> exactly is it it <laughs> if if somebody makes a notice board and there are like 100 notice notices on that notice board and they put a notice board every notice on this notice board is false <laughs> now what does that mean if every notice is false then <laughs> then even that notice is false isn't it that means other notices can be right so these sort of statements are called as self contradictory statements so self contradictory statements the very assertion of that statement is a refutation of that statement it like suppose if i say i don't exist <laughs> what do you mean <laughs> i have to exist to say i don't exist isn't it <laughs> so each of these statements is a self contradictory statement so that's why if we presume an atheistic world view and consider evolution as completely an atheistic process as a completely unguided process then evolution becomes a self contradictory assertion if everything is just neurochemical firings and brain electrochemical secretions then nothing remains true even evolution doesn't remain true you could say that okay in the history of evolution right now we think this is true but maybe in the future our brain chemicals will be secreted in a different way and will come up with some other understanding so the a rigidly naturalistic world view leads to the rejection of all knowledge we can know nothing about nothing but none of us function like that we seek knowledge as a serious pursuit whether it is for earning money whether it is for developing relationships whether it is for curing diseases we seek knowledge seriously so even the most rigid atheist that's why even the most hardcore atheist does not live as an atheist if we were living as a atheist you know we would be constantly having doubts you know is my understanding right am i actually seeing this person you know there's a atheist who has written a book called the atheist who didn't exist <laughs> so atheism actually undercuts the existence of everything including atheism itself so that is reason was this clear or is it too confusing hmm? yes ma'am uh, like i think i could summarize it as like uh, rationality is not causation or i will be incorrect if i say so uh, rationality is not causation Yeah. yeah that's a state that statement is true i like it's like again laws of nature don't cause anything but what what i'm talking about is slightly different what i was saying is that if we reduce everything entirely to just unguided matter then unguided material phenomena they don't uh, lead to any reliable cognition of anything so wh what do i mean by say for example some people Uh, their tongue secretes saliva when they eat a particular kind of food i was in hawaii a few months ago and there there was a couple who were hosting me so that mata ji said she came from uh bielorussia and their profession there was they would actually catch crabs and make crab food and sell it now crabs are among the few animals which are cooked alive you know fish side list they cut and they're cooked but the crabs if you if you cut them or kill them then they start rotting very fast germs come in so you know you cut them you, you just actually catch a crab and then throw it in hot water and you cook it alive horrible pain so she said i never i didn't even think about it when i came to krishna consciousness i realized i just can't do this so now, the point i'm making is that somebody who has been eating cra or crabs you know as soon as they see the crab fluttering and struggling for its life their mouth will start watering the 
for us we might get horrified how can anybody do this? be so brutal like this now if if that is the food that causes their mouth to water well they will eat that food and somebody else some other food food causes the mouth to water they will eat that so similarly my brain starts secreting chemicals when i hear this theory your brain starts secreting chemicals when you hear that theory well then what is real no the brain apart from brain secretions apart from tongue secretions there nothing is real because there is nothing there is no within the atheistic world view there is no conscious observer separate from the tongue secretions or the brain secretions so materialism doesn't leave any room for a conscious observer and our understandings are simply brain secretions so so we are locked into ignorance based on whatever causes stimulation of our brain fluids that's what i'm talking about so einstein himself was very troubled by this implication he said that atheism ultimately this is one point you know you talk about theism has many rules and regulations that's true at a functional level but at, at you may say my free will is restricted i was at an interfaith meeting uh, and then we were talking about how young people perceive religion so there was a christian pastor and he said that they did some survey so one young boy he says what do you think about priests they asked this question so this young boy he said a priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone somewhere is having some fun <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that was their conception you know don't do this don't do this don't do this so many rules and regulations now that's what you, you may feel that religion restricts and puts rules on us but actually the very fact that rules are told to us means there is a implication that we have free will and with our free will we should follow a particular rule but atheism re rejects the existence of our free will itself atheism far from giving us freedom takes away our free will itself because atheism says we are simply biological robots and we are programmed in a particular way and that's how we will act so einstein was very troubled by the implications of a rigidly atheistic world he said that the nazis who killed millions and millions of people and einstein himself was per persecuted by nazis that's how he came to america so he said that you know you couldn't hold the nazis responsible if we were having a purely atheistic world view because he says their biological programming was such that they programmed to kill now does anyone function like that you know if i suddenly come up to one of you and slap you in the face yes why did you slap me well my my biological programming told me to slap you you will slap me back so my biological programming told you to told me to slap you <laughs> see all of us we hold each other accountable for our actions the systems of justice are based on the presumption of free will but a purely uh, materialistic reductionistic world view leaves us with no free will because we are just our brain secretions and our bodily actions there is no conscious being with free will that's why there's no way we can acquire knowledge so reason and the capacity for reasoned reflection and the capacity for reasonable decision making all of these are taken away by an atheistic world view okay the, that's r i'll conclude quickly conclu with e e is effect now by effect ultimately <clears throat> we want to live in the world and which world view helps us the better to live more effectively now of course religion often comes uh, in the press for bad reason, for all the bad negative reasons one of them is terrorism and oh because of religion violence happened here because of religion violence happened there because of religion violence happened there yeah it's true and it's it's unfortunate but what is the solution is atheism the solution will atheism bring in paradise on earth we try that now we all talk about world war 1 world war 2 or terrorist attacks Mm, which killed so many people but atheism was tried as a state religion in soviet russia and in china and from the 1920s onwards till about 1987 or whatever in 
these two countries a hundred million corpses resulted and that's a conservative estimate hundred million is more than the number of people who were killed in world war one world war two and all other wars in the 20th century so atheistic regimes killed far more people than now world war one and world war two the religion was not a factor in that it was purely territorial grabbing power hunger for power but even if you consider all other wars combined together atheistic regimes killed people within themselves anybody who suspected of being a dissident just killed and an organized killing and this same lady she told me that she's now she's married to a Prabhupada disciple she was 60 65 she told me that she came to America because at that time in their when she started she got a Bhagavad Gita from somewhere she started reading it and then at that time in the Soviet world every third person was an informer so in your home itself there's an informer and she was she was just because of that she was fired from her job and she was told if you unless you stop going for these meetings you know we will fire your father from his job and we will ensure that your children will not that your other brother sister will not be allowed to be in the go to any schools they'll be kicked out of the schools and your life will be hell so she decided at that time instead of doing that she just left the country she came to israel and then became to america but thousands and thousands of people were persecuted and killed so the point i'm making here is that history shows us very clearly that human beings are capable of violence and those who are violent those who are in rajas and tamas they will look for some reason to be violent and religion can become a reason for violence atheism can become a reason for violence materialism can be a reason for violence race can become a reason for violence caste can become a reason for violence uh, so there can be <clears throat> there can be there are people who will be violent and if we consider the as i said if you compare religion has been a prevalent force in human history for quite some time you know our oldest artifacts that science has found are religious artifacts among the oldest are the religious artifacts so religion has been around there for a very long time and again see what we are trying we are not trying to we can't conclusively prove what is right or what is wrong we're saying what requires more faith so according to if if science and the evolutionary theory is true then what does evolution do evolution eliminates that which is unfavorable for survival all those things are unfavorable for survival evolution eliminates that and those things are favorable for survival evolution pretends that so religion in the history of humankind has had tremendous staying power now people who lived thousands of years ago they lived in far more we might think of oh, terrorists are there and terrorists may kill so many people but we are not afraid of a tiger pouncing on us and killing us so people in the past lived in far tougher situations than what we are living at least in the historically documented past that we have and they didn't have idle time to just think about some belief if that belief were be burdening people those having that belief would have been eliminated so if religion has survived for so many millennia it must have some utility atheism has had power just for it's increasing in power just for about a century or so and the consequences have been devastating wherever atheism has been tried as a state religion it has caused utter devastation and this has been well documented that the now somebody may say actually that was not atheism that was communism but communism was strongly founded in atheism and the persecution was very much targeted in an organized way against religion going beyond such extreme examples of say religious violence or atheistic violence if you look at a universal level scientists have found there's a handbook of religion and health which has compiled together 3000 studies done by people research studies researchers from all over the world and is published by the uh, by oxford it's a oxford handbook of religion and health they call it so it is the most single most authoritative study 
on the correlation between religion and health that has been done till now. And it's not just a study, it's a meta study which brings in together various studies across the world. And what they have found is every single study indicate that religious people are more mentally and physically healthy than irreligious people. Whether it is in terms of likelihood of getting heart attacks or strokes or whether it is in terms of depression or suicidal tendencies or in terms of vulnerability to addictions, religious people have it better. In fact, this has been so well documented that the Reader's Digest pub published an article called that <coughs> it was that on an average religious people live 11 years longer than non-religious people. And what do you, how do they define religious? They cannot really go into people's hearts and look at their belief system. It's just that if people attend a religious program once a week, that level of religious commitment they have it seems to have tremendously positive effects on health. And in today's world also, and I am not going to go into the difference between religion and spirituality in an elaborate way, but we see that in today's world, more and more people are turning towards something higher in life. Meditation, mindfulness, they, I mean, so many studies are proving that they benefit. And many people who are not able to be, have their stress treated, by conventional scientific medicines, they are finding that they are better able to manage their life and their emotions by meditation. So I was in California and Silicon Valley. So I spoke at, I spoke there at Google as well as Intel and Salesforce. So Salesforce has a whole, a whole area devoted to meditation. And they have regularly mindfulness seminars conducted over there. And there are so many studies that are documented that such exercises actually improve the health of people. And ultimately, the company is not concerned about what you believe. The company is concerned about how you perform. And from their performance perspective, people who do are a part of these exercises, say mindfulness, meditation, they, they, the company has to pay less health insurance for them. They, <laughs> they perform better. So instead of just looking at some isolated examples of some extremists, there can be extremist atheists, there can be extremist religionists. But if you look at the overall effect, so theism has a far greater potential to transform ourselves for the better. In terms of the effect that we have, we can actually make greater sense of life and greater impetus to transform our life. Just with one last point I'll conclude. That somebody may say that, oh, but you know, you believe in some God and then, as you said, God, when expect, as expectations, God lets you down. That you know, okay, you, you devote yourself to God and then some terrible thing happens to you. So one, one the atheist uses the ultimate argument against religion. They call it the problem of evil. If there is a good God, why are so many bad things happening in life? Why do bad things happen to good people? So once I was asked this question when I was speaking in uh, MIT, Massachusetts. So I told, uh, I answered, said that, okay, why should bad things not happen to good people? I said, what do you mean? You know, good things should happen to good people, bad to bad. People. Why? What do you mean, why? I said, no, if there is no God, then why should there be any correlation between our actions and our results. If there is no God, there is no organizing principle that any action can lead to any result. So the problem within the atheistic worldview, you cannot have the problem of evil itself because everything is just interaction of chemicals. There is nothing except subatomic particles moving according to impersonal forces. So, what is good, what is evil? And if a one particular particle collides with another particular particle and something gets destroyed. Within the atheistic worldview, there is no reason why action should correlate with, with a particular action should correlate with a particular result. So the very fact that we talk about cause-effect correlation, that, that itself requires a theistic worldview. 
So in terms of effect, bad things can happen to anyone. And there is a bigger spiritual framework which can explain this. That's not what our thrust over here. But the thrust is over here that atheism and theism, when bad things happen, nobody has an explanation for that. In terms of our immediate perception. Athe now atheism might say just, oh, why do bad things happen? Oh, the world is rotten. This is how nature is. This is how it is. Live with it. A theist may say, okay, that, okay, it's, you know, it's God's will. Or he might say that it's karma from a previous life. We don't know either way for ourselves. But the difference is that in both cases, a, the problems that we face, they are as it is. So there is disorder in the world. But, you know, whenever there is disorder, we don't lose faith in the principle that there is order in the universe. What do I mean by this? I suppose suddenly we get go to a doctor because of some pain and doctor says you got cancer. <sighs> we horrified. But now cancer is one of those diseases for which the cause is almost very difficult. So many guys cancers, cause is very difficult to know. But now after that, what do we do? He says, is there any treatment for this? Now, as soon as we ask, is there any treatment for this? What do we mean by that? That means we are still accepting cause effect. I just don't know what, what caused this. I don't know what caused the cancer, but still I believe in cause effect. And therefore, I want to know by what effect this cancer can be removed. What medicine should I take? By which this will be removed. So there are some times in our life when some things don't make sense. But we don't reject cause effect connection just because some things don't make sense. We still keep functioning. So atheism has no right to ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Because atheism has no rational explanation for why action should correlate with result. Or anything can happen to anyone. Why shouldn't there be any order in the universe? Why should good people get good things? Atheism has no explanation for that. So it's like it's asking a question that question has an assumption and that assumption has no explanation in atheism. So atheism does not remove any problems. Theism also, you could say, now some people will say, who's seen karma? I don't believe in that. That's okay. We're not going over, over there. When bad things happen, if we understand that there is some order in the universe, then theism tells us that yes, there are problems, there will be troubles in life, but there is an ultimate purpose. If we live faithfully, if we live in a God-centered way, we will grow through this. We'll grow through this and we will evolve spiritually. So atheism does not remove problems. Atheism only removes the hope that problems have a purpose. What does atheism do? It only removes the hope that problems have a purpose. And it just sentences us to a very gloomy, pointless existence. And many of the atheists, like Frederick Nietzsche, who was a famous atheist who said, God is dead. Now, he also said that life is terrible. No, life is terrible. So he said, the best is if you are never born. Second best is if you died young. The worst thing that can happen in your life is if you live for a long time. Albert Camus was another atheist and he said that the world is filled with misery. Therefore, the only philosophical question worth asking is whether to commit suicide today or tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, atheism removes any hope for life. Problems everybody has to face, but at least theism gives us a, that there is an ultimate purpose, there is an ultimate plan. We are meant to evolve spiritually. And for our own living, the, the having some purpose, having some orientation is very important. Just as much as our body needs physical nutrition, our heart needs metaphysical orientation. What am I living for? What is the purpose of life? Some purpose we all need to have. But atheism removes all purpose. Theism provides us a meaningful purpose. And thus, theism is new. Atheism is much more reasonable than atheism. Atheism requires far more faith than atheism. I'll quickly summarize. 
or I spoke, I spoke on this topic of atheism, why atheism requires more faith than theism. And I used the acronym, what was it? More, M O R. M was? Meaning. Meaning. So in that I talked about how uh, <coughs> Stephen Weinberg said that the more the universe becomes comprehensible, the more it becomes, more it seems to be meaningless. It's like some message in some unfamiliar script. The more we decipher the script, the more we start making sense of the script and the words and the sentences, but the message seems meaningless. Mm -hmm. Something is missing. So what science, what science does is that science offers us sensible explanations about why things happen within the universe. Why do fruits fall? Why do the temperatures rise? Why do certain objects conduct electricity? But within an atheistic worldview, science can't explain or atheism can't explain the ultimate purpose of everything. So we have islands of meaning, but we are drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness. So that is M. Then O was origin. Yeah. So in origin, I talked about how atheism explains how everything came from nothing simply by redefining nothing so that it is something. And it's a complex quantum mechanical vacuum, which is certainly not nothing. The atheistic story of the universe is everything came from nothing existed because of nothing, nothing exploded because of nothing, and nothing gave rise to everything. And now, what theism tells us is that where did God come from? That is like asking what made a circle circular. It's intrinsic definition. God is the cause of all causes. He exists outside the causal chain, just as the author of a fictional story exists outside that outside the story. So now both require faith. But the idea of an unconscious quantum mechanical vacuum creating everything is eminently irrational. It's like by saying that because of the laws of nature, the universe created itself out of nothing. Well, it's not nothing in the laws of nature existing, and the laws of nature themselves don't create anything. They they only explain the connection between cause and effects. The universe 500 plus 700 is 1200 doesn't create 1200 dollars in your pocket. Now, so there has to be money already existing. So that does, that so relatively speaking, for the explanation of odd for origin, the atheistic explanation requires far more faith. Then reason was that no, a evolution, uh, uh, if we consider evolution to be true, and we consider evolution to be entirely unguided process, so there is nothing except matter existing, which is what atheism holds. Then what happens? Our everything is simply just brain chemicals, it's just chemical secretion. And chemical secretion in the body is directed simply for survival, mm, survival and reproduction, not for answering life's ultimate questions. Then why do we have, we have that search for understanding ultimate, uh, seeking ultimate answers? And secondly, why do we have, how can we know if anything is true or not? Say your tongue might get secreted on, on seeing a particular food, somebody else's tongue might get secret, might get secret saliva on seeing crabs burning, crabs boiling in water alive. So now, what is right, what is wrong? Just by the tongue secretion, you cannot say that. So similarly, uh, the brain secretions are all that happens whenever we uh, analyze anything. So somebody's brain secretions might happen when they th study theism. Somebody's brain secretions might happen when they study when they study atheism. So, we don't, a, a rigidly materialistic worldview leaves us with no reasonable reason for believing that our understanding is correct. All that we have is brain secretions. So, in that way, the rigidly materialistic worldview becomes self contradictory, like saying, I don't, I, I can't speak a single word of English. And it under, we may say that religion is restrictive because it puts limits on our freedom, but atheism actually denies our free will itself because we are just biological robots and Einstein was also troubled by this prospect and lastly E was effect in terms of effect I talked about three things if we call, consider extremist violence then like earlier I said there are operational values and function, uh, are fundamental values so there can be atheists who are good people and there can be atheists who are bad people but in the cross section of human society there will be good and bad people both and if the bad people happen to be a thesis, they will use theism for committing violence and the bad people happen to be atheists they will use atheism for committing violence so at least in recent human history the track record of atheism is far worse than the track record of theism throughout human history in terms of 
murderous wars, murderous campaigns that have happened. 100 million corpses in less than a century. No religion has that track record. All religions combined together don't have that track record. But if you put aside extremism, if you consider normal society, normal living, so the Oxford Handbook of Science and Reli of Religion and Health is uh, 2000 studies combined together that relig religious practice leads to better physical and mental health, including a longer lifespan. And lastly, in terms of effects, see all of us face problems in life. The atheists ask, why do good things happen to God, bad people? Atheism doesn't have any right to ask this question because atheism doesn't explain why action should be correlated with the reaction. Uh, so, but uh, even if we face problems and even if we don't have a satisfactory explanation for this within our framework, but still what atheism is, it doesn't remove the problems, it only removes the hope that the problems have a purpose. Whereas religion is okay, there are problems, but they're all ultimately meant for our good, for our growth. And that gives us a purpose for our living. So just as our body needs physical nutrition, our heart needs metaphysical orientation. And that is provided much more by a theistic worldview than an atheistic worldview. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So thank you for surviving this complicated class. <laughs>